This podcast is supported by Secretly Society, a record club offering the best new albums in exclusive limited edition vinyl colours delivered to your door each month with perks like free shipping, members only discounts and first dibs on rare finds. Secretly Society is a record club for new collectors and crate diggers alike. Sign up and become a member wherever you are in the world. Just head on over to secretlystore.com. Hello, we're back with another episode of Secretly Frequencies, a podcast where we test musicians and labels on their knowledge of their back catalogues and hopefully uncover a few great stories and gems along the way. Today, we're going to be speaking with Clem Creevy, singer, writer, and all-round awesome person from Los Angeles' finest, Cherry Glazer. But in perhaps the most fun twist of the series so far, not only do we have Clem, but we also have the band's namesake, none other than KCRW's Cherry Glazer, here to present the podcast with me. Thank you so much, Tom. It is great to be here. I have had such a fun time sort of watching Clem from afar. I first met her back in 2014, and it has just been amazing to watch her career play out. No doubt we'll be uncovering just why they took your name for their own band. What did you think when you first heard that? You are enshrined in rock and roll forever. I was unbelievably flattered. I had a really hard time getting my head around the idea that anyone would want to name a band after me, but I definitely will take my shot at rock and roll immortality. Okay, so you've spent 15 years as a radio host and producer in California, working for the globally renowned KCRW, covering a ridiculously wide range of topics, and you're the local morning news show host. You've also won a couple of awards for best local radio anchor, right? Yes. Well, hopefully there'll be another one coming for this podcast episode. Thanks for joining us on Secretly Frequencies. Now for a little more background on the band Cherry Glazer. Formed in 2013 in Los Angeles by Clem Creevy, who was just 15 years old at the time, they've released three albums and have a fourth on the way. Bursting out of the LA garage scene with a nod to lo-fi surf rock, their sound has become more refined, defined and powerful with each record. And we're really excited to explore that evolution with Clem today. Clem, welcome to the show. Clem, where are you right now? I am currently in my studio space in downtown LA. Ah, and you are surrounded by your drums and everything right there, right? I do. I have everything in here. It's kind of like a little storage space, but I also share it with a couple of other bands, so we kind of all rehearse here. So anytime inspiration hits, you're ready. Well, speaking of inspiration, perhaps we should kick things off with the first song. Yes, that's Shattered from the upcoming album, I Don't Want You Anymore. So, new album, really exciting. What are your ambitions for the record and what are your ambitions for the next couple of years for Cherry Glazer? I just listened to the album and I'm just so happy to be releasing it. I don't know if I've ever like felt this way where I listen to it and there's just like, I mean, there are things that I would change, I guess. There are some moments that make me cringe because you always feel that way about stuff that you've done. But 
I don't know. I just love it so much. I can't wait to start playing it live. And I just imagine the live shows and like the feeling of connection and tapping into that emotion live for me it's definitely kind of a dark album and and things that i was meditating on my life it's just really like intense and emotional i'm excited to like hopefully share that feeling with with people through sharing the music and like playing it live and playing the shows i've been thinking a lot about like visuals and what i want the show to feel like i think i'm gonna be touring for like a long time hopefully do you know who's gonna be in the live band have you got have you started rehearsing is that all together my bandmate sammy she plays bass sammy for a shout out she's been with me since 2018 or 2019 and she's kind of like my rock in the band she's like my ride or die, the one who like really helps me figure everything out. And I don't even know if like I could do it without her. She's the absolute coolest and the best. And she's just like the best person you'll ever meet, really. <laughs> and then I've got Nick, my drummer, who's been with me for almost like a year and a half. He's so committed. He's so cool. Um, I love him too. So they've been playing with me now for a minute and then i have a few other people that i'm auditioning um as another member so it's gonna be like right now we're playing as a three-piece sort of the original formation of the band was a three-piece i played so much synth and so many guitars on this album (laughs) it's gonna be nice to have someone playing that as well live so yeah we've got our little unit and yeah i love my band right now Yeah, I definitely have my people. You know, Clem, you have 12 years under your belt at this point, which is kind of amazing to think. You've got four albums out. Is there something you haven't done that you're like, I got to do this? I haven't done this yet. It's got to happen. I really want to try a squirrel suit, Um, like flying on one of those things. (laughs) In concert or just for the heck? (laughs) In concert. I was thinking just for the heck, but in concert. (laughs) That is the move. (laughs) Clem, you were talking about you expect to tour for a long time. After all the work that goes into an album, taking it on tour, does it sort of become more yours in a way because of the sharing it publicly or... I mean, I love the new forms that it takes on once other people start like listening to it. And, like, shouting the lyrics back and stuff. I definitely think it's going to, like, take on a different vibe, like, playing it for the first time in front of people. I kind of feel like people might be, like, learning about me in this interview right now. I'm not, I'm not, like, very hardcore. Like, I'm actually just, (laughs) like, I'm, like, really nervous. (laughs) So, time for the next song. Um, I assume you know what song that was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was Had Ten Dollars off the EP of the same name, released on Suicide Squeeze in 2014. So at that point, a lot of the band was still in high school. Is that right? 
Yeah, we were. I'm pretty sure that was 11th grade. I definitely remember there was a time when there were kids that were younger than us, 9th and 10th graders, that listened to Cherry Glazer and all of a sudden thought we were, like, cool. That's when we felt like we had just made it. What was it like going to school with your own fan club, Clem? It was sick. It was awesome. <laughs> and that track was chosen by Heidi Slimane to soundtrack Saint Laurent's runway show in 2014 as well. That must have felt really big deal at the time. How did that come about? Heidi was always coming to our shows. It would be this like gross sweaty house show somewhere and then there'd be like some <laughs> very chic leather clad french man in the corner and then yeah he was like do you want to do some modeling for saint laurent and uh then he asked us to do the runway soundtrack now how about another track is my song Soft Drink. That was Soft Drink, which was released as a single in 2021 on Secretly Canadian. So I assume that you were writing that during the early stage of the pandemic. What was your experience of the pandemic like? It sucked. <laughs> yeah, it was scary. And I guess if I'm being totally honest, I had been touring a lot. I felt like I hadn't slept pretty much since I had graduated high school and started touring. And then when the pandemic hit, I felt like I was able to sleep for like eight hours a night for the first time in my life. <laughs> At least I had that. Did the pandemic give you a chance? I know some musicians say that the pandemic allowed them to sort of delve into their own music, spend, you know, spend some time experimenting perhaps with new approaches, new ideas. Did that happen for you? Yeah, absolutely. That's a lot where this song came from was having the restrictions of having to do everything in the box and not as a live band. So it was a lot of me just setting up a little makeshift studio in my apartment and recording and putting all my ideas out into the computer. Did you miss being on the road, Clem, after a certain point? Were you like, you know, I really want to get back out with people. I want to be performing live. This is something that feeds me in a way. I did. I definitely did. Being on the road is something that I get a lot of satisfaction out of. There were certain parts of the past couple of years where I was like itching for it. But I was sort of going through a lot like personally and emotionally and I guess it was a good period of time for me to slow down and stop and like focus on my life when I'm touring. It's easy for me to like escape all of the problems that I have. It sort of forced me to not do that and like not run away. So this one was definitely a slightly slower paced, quite electronic feel to it. What were you listening to? What was influencing you at that time? I love Yeji. Yeji was kind of an influence for me during the time. Love the vibes. I also like Over Mono, that British oh, electronic yeah. duo. This song is also special to me because it's the first song that I did 
on my own after kind of shifting the band to not have the same members that it had. Yeah, this was kind of the first song that I produced myself and it felt like I had a lot of creative control and it was it was cool. Okay, we're going to hear some more music now. Trick or treat dance floor. Trick or treat dance floor. That was Trick or Treat Dance Floor off the album Haxel Princess in 2014 from Burger Records. That one actually got me a little tripped up when you first played it. Oh wow! <laughs> this is an old song. I was it like, is a oh. Really old song. Budge. <laughs> and then I, and that came to me and then i was like oh god thank god uh, yeah I, I mean honestly like it's not too tricky because like the first line is trick or treat dance floor but when yeah. you first played it the guitar riff i was like oh god we're actually gonna run into this problem where i actually forgot which song that was <laughs> do you listen back to your old records or do you tend to find that you're like i've recorded them they're done okay yeah i actually listen to my own music because I want to remember like the sense of it when I was writing and recording it so that I can remember that for when I'm playing it live and for the fans and the listeners because honestly for me the songs are going to change naturally over time because I'm maturing as a musician and a different band and like different gear and different style the songs take on different meaning for me over time as well so um let's go back to that time it was 2014 it's your first record i have to ask the big question here because we have cherry herself here why cherry glazer it's just a great name (laughs) i like it it's just cool it sounds good and it's rad and yeah (laughs) I wish I had a deeper explanation for you. It's just simply a great name. Well, let me tell you, my association with you, Clem, is my great claim to fame. There's no question about it. It comes up at the station more than anything else. So, I mean, I I, I think uh, such as my career is, I owe it to you at this point, Clem. Should we hear some more music? What is grilled cheese? That's right. Grilled cheese from the album Haxel Princess, released on Burger Records in 2014. I want to ask, on like surface level, you've got this song that's about grilled cheese, but actually your lyrics and imagery often depict women sort of defiantly eating and embracing sexuality. And you've said that you want to depict women as living, breathing people with needs. That that seems like a really important theme for you in your work. Can you elucidate on that? Yeah, that's definitely always been a theme for me, depicting women as not worrying about people's expectations and sort of 
doing away with like any forced standards. Mm-hmm. I like to sort of just embody an idea and hope that that becomes a reality like in our world. And so, oh, like the grime and stuff, because mm-hmm. it's, yeah, something that I like to see in the world. I was reading uh, at one point that two of your inspirations, among many others, were Joni Mitchell and Joan Jett, two really strong women. What kind of inspiration do you take from female musicians like that, where you say, okay, that's really something I want to build on? I mean, I love women. I love what they have to say. And sometimes I just get... I just need their voice. You know, we're so inundated with art made by men and a lot of it is great. It just gets exhausting after a while. You just like, I don't know, you feel the like urge to listen to something made by not a man. As someone who's always trying to feed off of art, that's something that like I absolutely need. It's funny though because... I think my biggest inspirations were actually boys and like men who I saw playing shows like around town. And I was kind of like, I could do that Mm -hmm. like easily. (laughs) I remember like seeing No Age at Human Resources, I think it was called in Chinatown. And it was a gnarly show. And I just was like, I could play music like that. And I could have that kind of stage presence. And I feel like very very truly that i could do this so you were young when you were going to these shows yeah but they, they i know were it's kind of crazy i don't know why our parents let us do that like we talk about that all the time my friends and i were like is that just an la kid thing like we were crazy but at that point cherry glazer wasn't the very first thing you're doing it was clember is that right yeah, that's right. Right, that and that was a solo project to start with, and you were uploading tracks to SoundCloud around that time? Yeah, I had recorded, like, Teenage Girl and, and Grilled Cheese and Trick or Treat Dance Floor with my friend Joel Morales, a.k.a. Joel Jerome, at his right. studio in Eagle Rock. And, yeah, then I put them on SoundCloud that's kind of how people found out about me and then I wanted to like start a real band I changed the like name on SoundCloud to Cherry Glazer and then had my bandmates join me and then they learned those songs and then you know we wrote some songs together and yeah that's kind of how where it came from it did start out as a solo project and that's kind of feel like I feel like that's where it's coming back now with this new album. Right. It's very much like it feels like a return to roots. And we've got another song queued up here. It's not my home this evening.
And that was White's Not My Color this evening, off the album Haxel Princess, released in 2014 by Burger Records. That is definitely the much more punk side of Cherry Glazer that we're hearing there. I do want to talk a bit more about this, um, like the DIY scene that you sprang from. You mentioned No Age and The Smell. It seemed like a very vibrant community that was going on at that time. Yeah, there was like a lot of cool bands for sure. I remember I liked uh, Miko Miko. That was like bleached Mm -hmm. before. Yeah, they were cool. There were some punk bands that were sick. (laughs) You know, it's weird because it didn't feel like a moment or an era or whatever when it was happening. But I definitely think of it that way now. So many years later, I'm like, oh, that was such a special like moment in time do you see young musicians coming up behind you and feel like oh your life is completely different than mine because of social media do you feel like that has really changed things even though it wasn't that long ago that you started i was still a part of that social media being like a big part of a band's social circle or whatever But yeah, it definitely felt a lot less like worldwide. You have TikTok and it's just this entertainment platform. It's what all the major labels care about. If the artist's song is going to trend on TikTok or not. I guess I just try to make music that feels good to me, honestly, and try to not worry about anything. Good for you. Easier easier said than done. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a brilliant way of looking at things, though. And it does seem to me that that really is the artists that have the longevity that stay true to themselves and just believe in what they're own doing and and plow their own path, you know. So let's move on to the next song. Guys, that is the absolute banger. Told you I'd be with the guys from Apocalyptic 2017. So, this was your first, well, second album, but first with Secretly Canadian. Um, how did you come to work with Secretly? Chris had been coming to some shows around that time, like 2016, and yeah, I just remember seeing him at some shows and he was like, I've got this label and you should be on it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should say this. Well, it was between them and a major label and I ended up going with them. I wanted to be on a big indie as opposed to a major and they seemed like the best of like the indie labels even more so than that over time i've just like grown to really like love ben and chris they've supported me so much over the years we've kind of had this long relationship at this point so i feel like they've seen a lot of different evolutions that i've gone through and i just feel like they really like get it well, of course, I'm a little biased on that. <laughs> um, and 
I also want to talk here a little bit about the, this was bringing in Joe Ciccarelli, the producer. So this was a bigger sound. What was it like going into a bigger studio and a bigger production? Is that something that you'd been really hoping to do as you were starting the band? Yeah, it was definitely a bit of an adjustment. It was an adjustment to like hear things in that sort of way, in this very produced way. But I definitely always wanted to explore everything that I could, like, as an artist and build what I had going. And I I had so many, like, ideas and wanted to grow so badly. So it just felt like the natural sort of evolution of things was definitely weird hearing my music super produced for the first time. I actually cried. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because it was so different than, like, what I had been doing. But I ultimately <laughs> ended up really liking it. Did you feel like, wow, I've really arrived? I just felt like, okay, this is a new step in a new direction. Um, this is a new chapter. And I'm just going to fully embrace it i ended up really loving what what i made and especially when i listen back now all of the ideas and sort of all of the new sonic landscape that i was getting into like for the first time and i learned so much about like studios and i learned how to produce through that experience okay should we hear some more music It is Nurse Ratched, also from Apocalyptic in 2017. So we've talked about why Cherry Glazer. Let's talk about why Nurse Ratched. (laughs) Yeah, I definitely wrote it after I either read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or watched the movie. And yeah, I just thought she was a great character to like write a song around. I love playing that one live because there's that instrumental section where the guitar is just going crazy and the halftime drums come in. And for some reason, that just hits me like in the right spot. And I feel like that is my favorite part of like playing the set. Oh, wow. It's really cathartic. (laughs) What is it about Nurse Ratched that kind of attracted you? I just love scary ladies. (laughs) (laughs) I just watched The Craft for the first time last night, Mm -hmm. and it was really cool. I really like that movie. I just, I love a good scary lady. Do you see it as a woman being powerful, maybe warped, but powerful? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. There's just something fun about a scary lady. Really? I can see a concept album where every, maybe this is what's coming next for you, is it a concept album where every song is your favourite scary ladies, Clem's top ten favourite scary ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, you described yourself at, at one point as, uh, around this record, as an, a, an overconfident teenager trying to solve the world's problems. Is that something that you look back on and, and, and laugh about? And do you think that you did? solve the problems <laughs> yeah pretty much pretty much done <laughs> done <laughs> almost like i can retire now it's all taken care of <laughs> yeah totally i definitely think that as i've grown i've become 
um, I guess more self-aware and Mm -hmm. a little bit more open to the fact that things aren't always black and white and that there are so many factors and possibilities and explanations for things and that things aren't always what they seem on the surface. I think that like I have trouble these days deciding that someone is like a bad person. Like that feels a lot harder to me to do now than it used to be when I was a kid. I think Mm -hmm. when I was younger, I was just like, that person's bad. This is a bad person. Now I feel so much more like confused. (laughs) And I feel like people go through so much shit that makes them the way that they are. And you never really know like, what someone is going through and, and yeah it, it i don't know as i've gotten older i think that's been a big huge part of where i'm at now which honestly kind of sucks i hate not being able to just decide uh like you suck because it was a lot easier to do that okay we're gonna hear next song now where should i go daddy what should i say where should i go is it okay with you? Who should I fuck, Daddy? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who should I go, Daddy? Who should I say? Who should I go? Is it okay with you? That was Daddy on the album Stuffed and Ready, released in 2019 by Secretly Canadian. At our last yeah. show, some guy, after every song, would be like, Daddy, like, play Daddy next. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, because we didn't have it in the set list. So I was like, oh, my God. And then, like, after every song, I would just, like, pretend, like, not to see him. <laughs> <laughs> He wants daddy on repeat. <laughs> yeah. There's a remix of this track by Reggie Watts. Was that a remix that you had sort of put together or was it suggested to you? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. I kind of was like, why don't we just like try for Reggie Watts and like see what happens? And then I think I just DM'd him and he was like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. Oh, no, actually, I had run into him at a party and we like. Oh, wow became friends at that party and then like our managers knew each other um so then they linked us up together and then he actually came to my studio space which is in this like crazy dirty building downtown it's like a warehouse and it was really funny to bring him here he's like famous famous dude you know you walk around you like would recognize him whatever and then i had to like take him up into this like broken elevator i was like i swear i'm not gonna like murder you i had to like (laughs) take him to this really sketchy building in the middle of downtown clem can i ask you a question about the lyrics really powerful talking about being your own person making your own decisions Do you feel like people want you to fit in a box, fit a certain stereotype as a woman and also as a performer? Yeah, I mean, I think within relationships, definitely, it's hard not to fall into these relationship dynamics that end up being really like constricting for everybody involved. That was me feeling like I had fallen too hard into them sort of describing those feelings of trying to navigate what a relationship should be and I felt like I had a really like shitty like rubric for what that was and I was realizing like how much it like hurts 
to just be in a toxic relationship. You recorded Stuffed and Ready with Carlos de la Garza, who was also involved in the, in the previous record. You wrote a lot of this record whilst you were touring. I think that's the first record that that was the process, really. Your, your songwriting process ended up having to be done on the road. Is writing on the road something that you enjoy doing or is it something that becomes a really difficult part of the touring life? Like, How do you approach it? I think that writing in general just comes really randomly for me. Because I was spending so much of my life on the road, that's why I end up writing so, so many songs. In 2017, we played 200 shows. And so we were on the road for like eight months or something. I just naturally ended up writing a lot of Stuffed and Ready during that time. Am I right in thinking that you actually wrote and recorded an entire other record in this period and and ended up scrapping it? Yeah, I have a vaulted album. (laughs) I made it with John Vanderslice at Tiny Telephone in San Francisco. I wanted to go in another direction, ultimately. And so then I went and made Stuffed and Ready. But some of those songs, like Daddy, I had written... And I have another sort of alternate version of as a part of that album. Are any of those songs going to see the light of day? I don't know. (laughs) Maybe. But I don't think so. You know, um, the makeup of the band has changed a lot over the years. Do you like mixing it up, working with different musicians? Yeah, definitely. I mean... I have always written all the songs myself, like all of the changes and guitar parts and all of the lyrics and vocal melodies and stuff ever since it was clean. But something that I do actually is like, I always hope that people think it's kind of messed up. But yeah, I'm always like, oh, I hope that the public thinks that a man wrote this because then they're, they're going to say that it's good and they're going to think that it's better when people know that something was made by a woman like they might not get into it or like have the same standard for it are you noticing any change in that perspective do you think things have changed do you think things have got better or do you think that sort of internalized sexism is just as prevalent as ever uh i think it's just as prevalent as ever i mean people have to address themselves and like have to deal with their own internalized misogyny and sexism and like I have to do that all the time on a daily basis like to be honest it's hard for me to talk about feminism and politics these days I don't know why it's just like hard for me I guess I think that I was so like sure of things or I thought I was so sure of things And it was something that I was really comfortable talking about for a while. But it's just become like really hard for me. I don't know why. It's the same thing as growing up and realizing that there are so many perspectives to consider. And like things aren't just black and white. My own politics have potentially changed. I feel a little less cool with being like, this is the way things are. I don't know. They're changing and they're complicated. I get worried about saying something that I'm going to regret. Do you find that writing songs where you're able to address some of these themes is your outlet for sort of thinking about it and how you approach deciding like where you stand on things? Yeah, definitely. I'm definitely the type of artist that like gets all of their thoughts and feelings out through the music and it's very therapeutic for me as a guitar player and as a singer. A lot of that for me is therapy. And so, yeah, that's definitely where I start to make sense of things in my brain. Do you think part of that's coming out of the pandemic, maybe? You've had time to be sort of with yourself? I think it has to do with the people that I surrounded myself with over the years. And I think it has to do a lot with my friends and who has sort of influenced me shaped my identity into like what it is now okay we're gonna move on to the next song now
drops off like a flower. <laughs> Is soft like a flower from the upcoming album i don't want you anymore so you did a lot of writing for this record and you wrote with other people for this one right i did yeah i did so many sessions over the pandemic with so many different producers i really loved eve tumor's album that he produced and so i did a session with him and I had done sessions with a lot of different producers, but he was definitely my favorite. I was like, this dude is awesome. He totally got the vibe and just like is a, such a great, supportive, collaborative person. I always felt very, not just listened to and heard, but like understood. I just felt like we were speaking the same language as far as like what we wanted the album to be and in a lot of ways i feel like this is the album that i've always like wanted to make but haven't had a chance to until now i definitely feel like it's the first album since haxel princess where where i feel that way and so i'm really excited i mean i wouldn't change anything about the past two records that i did and you know i'm glad they exist but I just feel like this is the album that I've always really wanted to make for like years and years. It's like exactly how I would want it. It's exactly how I like it. I had a lot of creative control on this one. Basically like produced it with Eve all myself. And so, yeah. I definitely feel like this album is like me being more self-aware than I ever have been. And reflecting on i'm in a place where i'm not blaming other people for my bullshit um and this has a lot to do with that this has a lot to do with like coming to terms with my own bullshit reflecting on that (laughs) on being a little piece of shit sometimes and um (laughs) like yeah just me reflecting on being a little piece of shit basically do you feel like you are more at peace with yourself as a result clem I don't know if I would say that I'm at peace with myself quite yet. Maybe one day I will be. I I, I definitely work through that in my music for sure. Did it almost feel like a solo album in a way? I mean, obviously you're working with other musicians and stuff, but... It did, yeah. It definitely felt like a solo album. It was the first time in a while that I had like total creative control it was just me and Eve in the room figuring everything out together. Well, thank you so much. It's been really fun chatting with you today. Thank you so much. And that's it for this episode of Secretly Frequencies. You've been listening to me, Tom Davies, and my co-host, the inimitable Cherry Glazer, and our guest, Clem Creevy from the band Cherry Glazer can hear all the songs from today's episode on our playlists via the link in the show notes. The Secretly Society podcast is an original production of The Secretly Group. This episode was produced and edited by Sarah Miles and exec produced by House of Hutch. The project manager for The Secretly Society podcast is Mimi Gontar. Robbie Morris is the creative director. Look out for more from The Secretly Society wherever you get your podcasts.